So Willie started writing this series of four books uh, in 1999. And till 2019, he wrote this four parts that many of you can pick up today uh, as a four part series. It started with, uh, it started with Anarchy, it went on to White Mughals, it went to Return of the Kings, and we ended with the last Mughal. And it captured 350 years of the Mughal Empire, and of course, more importantly, the British, not the empire, but really the company. It was a company like Facebook or Twitter or, or whoever it was, or Enron, who captured and ruled India till 1857, which was the first war, the second war of independence, which is when it then transferred to the crown. How did that happen is what you're going to read or what you're going to hear from no less than the last Mughal himself, William Dalrymple. It, the story of the East India Company was a completely marginal story. Uh, people were not particularly interested in colonialism, um, and still less were they interested in the history of multinationals. But over the last 20 years, two things have happened. The empire has bitten back. The realities, the ugly realities of colonialism uh, of imperialism anywhere have finally trickled into the story of the British Empire. And what is true of any empire, whether it's the Roman Empire or the Ottoman Empire uh, or the Habsburg Empire, is empires are not created for those who are colonized. Uh, empires are created for the benefit of the colonizer, obviously. That's how, that's how it happens. And uh, I think we've seen a whole series of books um, both in, in, the, in the scholarly realm and, uh, and books that have reached huge audiences like Shashi Tharoor's um, Inglorious Empire, which have made many people aware of the far darker story uh, of the British Empire. Um, and this has extended around the world. Authors in every country have been contributed to this, which has partly resulted into this very complicated response to the Queen's death. Uh, the enormous mourning and respect for the Queen, which we've seen in Britain, has been matched by a sort of bafflement uh, and anger uh, at other people in, um, by other people in the former colonies uh, who see no reason uh, to celebrate the former imperialist. Uh, and, uh, and there's been some very sharp and dissonant, um, I mean, the gulf between the two sides has never been more widely clear than in the, the sharply different reactions to the Queen's death. The other thing that has happened in the last 20 years since I started writing these books is the rise of companies uh, such as Google and Amazon, neither of which existed 20 years ago or barely existed 20 years ago, uh, and which have come to remind us that companies can be richer and more powerful than entire nations, and that the greatest companies of our day, the big multinationals, uh, are richer and have a, have a turnover greater uh, than the most of the nations on earth. So the story of the East India Company, which was the first multinational, which was the first company, the first corporation that realized it could topple kings, overthrow rajas, um, execute nawabs, and with its armies drive peoples fleeing before it, the story of this company is now more important than ever and speaks to us more directly than ever. And I very much feel that the, I mean, I can, you can see it in the, in the reaction to these books from um, a, a, a plight scholarly reaction to my, the first of the cycle that came out, the White Mughals, uh, to the, uh, to I suppose Obama picking anarchy as one of his books of the year 20 years later, you've seen a much, much wider response uh, to these books, not through any uh, value of their own, but from the fact that this subject has come to be central in so many countries and this re-evaluation of this whole period of history uh, and, the, and the role of corporations in them. Um, and suddenly these books have found themselves very much at the center of current affairs. The story really begins far from India. This is a gorgeous uh, National Trust property now that you can pay your uh, 10 pounds and, and then have a cream tea and uh, all the usual things you get in, a, uh, in one of those uh, nicely curated British castles. Uh, it's Powys Castle on the uh, Welsh-English uh, Welsh border. 
Uh, and as you can see, hard to imagine anything more English looking. Box hedges, uh, Tudor windows, lovely Renaissance doorway. But step inside and there's a very different picture because Powys Castle contains more loot from Mughal India than any national collection in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, or Bangladesh. Uh, indeed, more probably than all of them put together. You have here uh, wonderful swords, shields, ivory chessmen, some major bits of, of history. This is Siraj Dalla's palanquin, abandoned on the battlefield of Plassey, the first great, uh, uh, the first great battle which the company uh, established itself militarily. Uh, this was his palanquin left on the battlefield. If you go through the arch at the end of that picture, you end up in a room which contains Tipu Sultan's uh, battle tent. What is this stuff doing here in a private house in the Welsh countryside? The answer can be found in a picture that you have to pass under to enter into this. And this is a picture which, though it's not a very good picture, and which doesn't, uh, it's hardly a great work of art, tells this story very dramatically. What you have is in the center um, uh, an Englishman in a red frock coat taking a document from the hands of a gilt mogul. Now this, the caption doesn't help much. Shah Alam conveying the gift of the Diwani to Lord Clive. What is it, some Christmas present, a, a, Diwani, a Diwali present? Uh, it's not. What this is, is the terrible moment when a corporation took over control of the economy of the four richest provinces of India. Following the defeats first at the Battle of Plassey, then at the Battle of Buxar in 1765, the East India Company managed to force the Mughal Emperor to hand over the rights to administer the economy, not to the British government, not to the Foreign Office, not to the British Army, but to a private corporation based in one tiny building in London. This is the building. It's just five windows wide. It's not even the two buildings on either side of it. It's just the tiny building in the middle a quarter of the size of the, of the library we're in now. That corporation had only 35 employees in its first century. When the Battle of Plassey was fought, there was less than 200 white men in India. How on earth did this company, from a country which, when the company was founded, was producing only 1.7% of the world economy, when India was producing about 30% of the world economy, how on earth did one corporation take over. Well, it's a long and complicated story, but in essence, the company borrowed money from Mawari Indian bankers. Why did they lend it? Because they got their money back with interest on time. The corporation looted, pillaged, asset stripped, raped, did a million terrible things, but it repaid its debts on time, and the bankers backed it. And although one set of bankers were Hindu and Jain vegetarians dressed in, in white homespun, and the other bunch were a bunch of, uh, of plump Englishmen in frock coats eating beef, these two found common interests in their business deals. And the British used the money they borrowed to buy an army. The army was not a white army imported from England. It was brown Indian sepoys locally recruited. Uh, initially about 10,000, then 20,000, then 40,000, then 100,000, and ultimately, by 1799, 200,000 troops, double the size of the British Army. So it's one of the weirdest stories in history. One corporation in a relatively middle-ranking European country, at the beginning of the story, borrows money locally to buy local soldiers, which it uses as mercenaries against other Indian armies. And as India, by the, 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 the main point of action, mid-18th century to the end of the 18th century, is fractured, they do it piecemeal, gobbling up kingdom after kingdom until by the 1803, they've got most of India south of the Sutlej. The whole of Indian history is a story of battles and, uh, and invasions, but nothing in Indian history or anywhere else in the world even begins to match the strangeness of this conquest made by a corporation using mercenaries uh, and hiring local uh, and get it on, based on loans locally sourced. This is where it all begins. The corporation had a founder, his name was Thomas Smythe, this is he. When the, he hears that the Dutch are beginning to make fortunes by cutting out the Italians and the Arabs and all the people who've been uh, moving cotton and spices from India via the Arab world up to Northern Europe. 
the Dutch railways, you can just sail around Africa and go straight to the uh, spice producer, producers in what we today call Indonesia, the East Indies, as they were called during the, uh, the Tudor period. And he, caught, he gathers all the local ship owners and industrialists, yeah, and proto-industrialists and um, money men in London, and he gathers a meeting, and here are the records of the money raised at this. It's like a startup. He gathers a lot of rich people, and he invites them to contribute, and this is what they contribute at that first meeting. First guy, you can see 200 quid, mayor of London. Second guy, George Dainty, is it? 1,000, and so on and so forth. It is literally like a modern startup. With that, they buy a ship. Uh, this guy, James Lancaster, is appointed the captain. He's just sunk the, the ship in the top left-hand corner, so he's a bit of a surprise appointment. Uh, and indeed, all his crew got eaten by cannibals on his previous attempt to reach the, uh, uh, the Spice Islands. But no one else in England has been to the Spice Islands, so he's one ahead in his job interview than everyone else. And uh, he recruits um, something of which England was, uh, uh, you could argue, still is full, but certainly in those days was very full, which is pirates. Um, because this is the era when uh, the Elizabethan state was actually uh, giving licenses out to raid Portuguese and uh, Spanish shipping coming back from uh, Panama and Mexico full of gold and silver. Uh, and uh, this, the plight word for these people in Elizabethan lexicon is privateers. So a lot of the privateers are the people that invest in the company, they fill the ships, off they go, they sail uh, off to Indonesia, to their own surprise they get there, but they don't even have to land and do a, a trade deal because they find a Portuguese ship coming in the opposite direction, and as they are a bunch of pirates, quite literally, uh, they land on the Portuguese ship, empty the hold, put it into the English ship and sail home again. Uh, and they sell the products for one million pounds. With this, they buy the first property on Leadenhall Street, which remains the headquarters of the company until it's rolled up in 1858. It looks like a kind of nice Elizabethan pub that you might find in the shambles of York or uh, some nice provincial English town, but with sort of jolly buccaneering ships on the top. And for the first 40 years, this company wages a semi-successful trade in the East Indies, but they're always outflanked by the Dutch. The Dutch at this point, this is the golden age of, of Rembrandt and so on, when the Holland is at its richest and at its most powerful. It has far more sophisticated banking and financial instruments than, than England. It has better ships. And in 1640, the company, like a startup which has slightly failed, uh, kind of redesigns itself. It has a meeting. Uh, it, it has to pull its, its horns in. And a deal is done. The Dutch get the Spice Islands, and in return, the East India Company gets a small muddy river in the uh, a small muddy island in the Hudson River called Manhattan, which turns out to be a rather good investment in the long term. With this, um, the, the company then decides to change its business model, and in 1640 it decides to focus not on Indonesia but for the first time on India, and not on spices but instead on textiles. And this turns out to be a brilliant decision because textiles is what India is fantastically good at making at this period. 1640 is roughly the same period as Shah Jahan is building the Taj at Agra. So this is a, a period when the Mughals are now uh, controlling almost the whole of India and Bangladesh and Pakistan and the whole of Afghanistan. It's the peak of the empire. Uh, and um, today, when you think of the moguls in Bollywood films, you think of them sort of lying in sort of, you know, in courtyards with silks and wh white, ele white, uh, not elephants, white um, <laughs> pigeons fluttering around. Um, not flying elephants, sorry, I don't know where this is coming from. <laughs> white pigeons fluttering around. What we don't see uh, on, on the Bollywood version of the moguls is the fact that these guys have made all this money because it's the world center of the textile trade. Silks, cottons. Uh, hangings, embroideries, uh, and particularly the simple white cotton produced in a million looms in Bengal. It's cheaper, better quality than anything elsewhere. And because the Mughals are basically nomads from Central Asia, they don't have a navy, or they certainly don't have a good one. And the British are better at basically exporting Indian goods than the Indians are at this period. So you find the East India Company coming in, buying stuff in the ports, particularly in Calcutta, uh, but along the Hooghly and exporting it out all over the world. And over the course of the 18th century, they make a lot of money. Um, they begin to buy, their, make, build their own ships in the dockyards at Deptford. It all goes well until Aurangzeb 
overexpands, and the Mughal Empire begins to collapse. At this point, um, Delhi has got a, a population of over a million. It's the largest city between Istanbul and Tokyo. The Chandni Chowk is one of the most elegant boulevards in the world, until this guy turns up, Nadir Shah. People have thought that it may be the Marathas that get to loot Delhi, or else the Sikhs in the Punjab, since they're close, or even the Jats in the Doab. But it's none of those. It's Nadir Shah. And he comes in like a lightning bolt. He defeats the Mughals at the Battle of Karnal. He takes um, Muhammad Shah Rangila into custody, uh, and they march into Delhi together. Eight weeks later, Nadir Shah leaves with 80, no, sorry, with 8,000 wagons filled with jewels and gold. All the jewels, all the gold, everything the Mughals had gathered and looted and, and stocked up and mined from across uh, Asia for the previous 150 years, Nadir Shah takes off in one fell swoop to Persia. And without this money, the Mughal Empire fractures. Imagine throwing a, 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 I don't know, a big mirror out of the top floor window here, and it smashes on the ground. That's what happens to India, where previously you had one unitary empire that controls the whole of South and Central Asia. Uh, now you have tiny city-states, Delhi, Jodhpur, um, Udaipur, Tanjore, Hyderabad, and so on. Each one of these competing against the other, and in this mixed-up world, uh, these guys are the new... Uh, it looks like a sort of uh, a pride parade, but these guys are the cutting-edge uh, 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 sepoys who are the, the hard-nosed military uh, 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 front line of their day. They're using techniques invented by uh, Frederick the Great, uh, mobile horse artillery, bayonets, muskets, uh, 18th century ballistics, and so on. And these new sepoy armies um, recruiting local infantrymen, they just recruit... Uh, any old uh, peasant from the uh, fields of Bihar and, uh, uh, and um, UP, uh, trained up, can defeat vast Mughal cavalry armies. And over the 1740s and 1750s, you see a series of defeats by Mog uh, as Mughal cavalry armies crumple under the musketry and cannon of these new techniques. But the guys who are winning the battles are local Indians. They're just from Avad and Bihar. The story hots up when Siraj Dawla, who's the Mughal governor of Bengal, decides to uh, take out Calcutta. They've been building fortifications without his permission, and in his view, he has every right to go in uh, and slap them on the wrist. He does more than that. He takes the city, murders half the, uh, uh, the civilians. There's an incident where uh, the survivors are thrown in something called the Black Hole, which is a, a huge historiographical uh, story of itself. Basically, the British exaggerate the number killed, but many people are killed in it. And uh, it's his incredible bad luck. Normally, he could have got away with this, but the particular week that he does this, this man has turned up with a fleet in Madras. This guy is Robert Clive. He's already proved himself in South India as a younger man, and he's been sent back because there's been a, a piece of false intelligence that has led the company to believe that the French are sending a fleet to attack them in India. So just like the Iraq war got caused by false intelligence about yellow cake and weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which never existed, so this war is changed by a piece of, uh, of mistaken intelligence, which leads the British to believe that this French army has come here, when in fact it was heading for Canada, all that Daniel Day-Lewis stuff in Last of the Mohicans. Uh, that war is about to break out, the French and Indian War, and the French have sent out a fleet to help that. Uh, but the British got the wrong end of the stick, think it's going to India, and Clive has arrived uh, with 40 ships off the coast of Madras, and then finds there's no Frenchman. He's sailed halfway around the world. He's going to be a complete idiot when he goes home. And then he hears that Siraj Dawla has attacked Calcutta, and it's his big moment. He sails up. He's now got something to liberate. He attacks Siraj Dawla. He retakes Calcutta. And then something very, this is a, um, something very important happens. He gets a letter from the local bankers who are called the Jugat Sets, who are like the Rothschilds of Bengal. They're Mawaris, newly settled in Bengal, about two generations, and they control the finances of Bengal. 
What they've designed is a brilliant system whereby the money which is given in tax in Bengal can be uh, withdrawn by the Mughal authorities from their Delhi office uh, by a hundi system. They just put in a note at one end and they withdraw the cash at the other. Um, and they get a 10% cut of the money transferred. This, over a period of, of 50 years, has turned the Jagat Sets into the richest men in Asia. Money drains into the coffers of the Jagat Sets like the Ganges drains into the sea, uh, as one historian says. And these guys offer Clive a million pound to get rid of Siraj Daula. Uh, he, they say he's a wounded tiger. He's been defeated in Calcutta. You've got to take him out completely. We'll do regime change together. And Clive says, sure. And the terms are a million quid to to Clive, a million quid to the East India Company, and up they go. He doesn't, he doesn't consult anyone. It, it takes six months to get a message back to London. He just goes and does it. So he goes in, and he fights the Battle of Classy, which is in British history textbooks, used to be seen as this glorious imperial war. In fact, it's a fix, because the main general on Siraj Dallas' side is also in on the plot, and has also been bribed by the Jugget Sets to walk off the battle halfway through, which is what he does. And, he, and when uh, Siraj Dada sees this, he realizes there's been treachery. He rides off, but he's captured, killed, and his body is paraded through the capital, Murshidabad. The next day, Clive walks in and just literally helps himself to the treasury, fills his pockets with jewels, many of which are now in Powys Castle. Years later, when he's finally brought before Parliament, and they ask him, you know, who authorized you to do any of this? You were meant to attack the French. We sent you to London to attack the French. We didn't give you any authorization to do any of this. Uh, he says, my lords, the bankers of the city were at my feet, a hundred men were waiting on me. I am, my lords, amazed by my own moderation. Uh, and all the sort of Tories fall apart, in the, uh, laugh, fall apart laughing in the, in the House of Commons and he's cleared. Uh, but this is the beginning. They seize Bengal at this period, they install a puppet government, what we today would call regime change. Uh, ten years later, uh, 1765, or eight years later, 1765, the Battle of Buxar, there is a second great victory, and Clive uh, uh, captures the person of the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam and imposes this treaty, the Diwani, whereby the company can control the economy of the richest provinces of the Mughal Empire. And at this point, they start increasing their army. They've now got all the, the proceeds of, uh, uh, of the... Uh, of the whole uh, Bihar, Bengal, and Orissa, and from 40,000 sepoys in the 1780s, it goes up to 200,000 sepoys in their army by, uh, by 1799. And they could basically outbid any other ruler. So the Marathas and Tipu Sultan, great fighters, but they simply don't have the financial resources to put the same amount of, uh, of, of cannon, of trained men, of mercenaries into the field. And one by one, they're taken out by the company army. Meanwhile, the company finds a new way of filling its coffers. On the marginal land, they start pl planting opium. The opium they sell in China, illegally. They fight two opium wars uh, to, to secure this trade. So that by 1800, the company becomes the largest narco operator in the world. It makes the Medellin cartel uh, look like child play. Uh, and uh, uh, so first of all, they'd been spice traders, then they become textile traders, then they realized they didn't have to send out any money to, to India at all uh, to buy these things. They simply tax the Indians, buy the textiles, and export them. Then they become narco operators. So this is a business that rather like the kind of, you know, the hideous creature in the alien movies keeps evolving into ever more deadly forms. The company is like that. It keeps changing. Every generation sees a new version of itself. But it also is, like so many big corporations, greedy and uh, foolhardy in its greediness. And in 1774, there's an enormous famine. Famines are frequent in India, but responsible rulers put aside grain in order to bail out people when, the, uh, when there is a, a lean year. Uh, in this case, uh, the East India Company has not uh, put aside any grain, and people start dying in droves, and then in hundreds of thousands, and then in millions. By the end of 1774, four million Bengalis, probably, the figures are, are not clear, but certainly between one and four million Bengalis have died. And effectively, the company has throttled the goose that lays the golden egg. 
All those weavers who are producing all these wonderful textiles, they're all dead now, so they can't produce any textiles. And eventually, there is no money to collect from their tax collectors. So in 1774, the news comes that the company has no income, uh, and its creditors start to fail. One by one, the banks go down. 30 banks collapse in less than six months in 1774, and the company looks like it's going to bankruptcy. It's like the subprime collapses of, of 10 years ago. The difference is that the company by now is too big to fail. And unlike Lehman Brothers, the government ban uh, bails it out. And in 1774, the, the, even the Bank of England can't bail out the amount of money needed, but the Parliament can. So Parliament effectively takes a 50% share of the company. And for the first time, the British government is now involved in this Indian operation. And it becomes something the government control of this increases. But by this stage, tax collectors are all over India, like James Todd and his elephant. Uh, the tea which has been bought in China is now being sold in Boston. And the Boston uh, Tea Party is East India Company tea that's poured into uh, Boston Harbor. Why? Because the East India Company famine and the terrible things they'd done in, in India were now well known, even in Massachusetts. Uh, and there's an awful lot of early patriot literature which, uh, which stirs up uh, understandable fear of having the East India Company let loose on the American colonies. So it's an important part of the story of this country, too. The East India Company flag looks strangely reminiscent of a later flag. Uh, and uh, the East India Company headquarters has now grown to the size of Buckingham Palace. Uh, and the boardroom is the place from which South Asia is controlled. It now has this enormous uh, dock in... Um, uh, uh, the East India Company dock where all the, where all the, sh the stuff is unloaded, uh, and an even larger dock at Brunswick Dock where every month 20 East India Company clippers uh, are, are finished and sail out onto the world uh, with all their uh, opium and cotton and all these goods. So it's become by this stage from a, a small and cronky Tudor startup, it's grown into the world's first multinational. But where it's very interesting is that it's not just Britain, sorry, it's not just India, which is at the receiving end. The company is also corrupting the legislature of, of Great Britain. Returned East India Company men, often in their 30s with ridiculous fortunes of a million pounds of, of looted wealth from India, come home by themselves uh, what's called a rotten borough, in other words, a sort of corrupt seat in Parliament. And by the 1780s, about a quarter of parliamentarians are returned East India Company men. On top of that, about three quarters of the MPs have shares in the company. Therefore, the chance of, the, of, 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 the, of Parliament legislating against the company uh, is hugely reduced. And the company has invented, in the process, uh, corporate lobbying. The very first case of corporate corruption occurs uh, on record anywhere in the world. Occurs when, in 1690, only 90 years after the creation of the company, the first governor of the, of the East India Company is placed in the Tower of London for handing out money to MPs to vote for the extension of its monopoly. So all the things that we today associate and fear corporations for, the way that through campaign donations, the, the, what's good for a company can become what's good for the nation. The policy of a company can suddenly become the policy of a nation. Uh, these things were things that were invented by the East India Company and which are its toxic legacy to big business today. This all goes on until 1857 when the great uprising breaks out the Indian mutiny. Uh, and there's these massive hangings uh, and uh, terrible mayhem across India. Hundreds of thousands are killed. Uh, and the East India Company is finally wound up uh, in 1858. This is the punch cartoon. It says nepotism, blundering, avarice, misgovernment, supineness. The, uh, Warren Hastings uh, is the governor of the uh, uh, of the East India Company, the Governor General. Uh, and when he's brought to trial by the, uh, by the company, the, um, uh, the Lord Chancellor goes up to the uh, bar in Westminster Hall, which is the same place where the Queen is now lying in state in London. And he opens proceedings by saying, corporations have neither bodies to be punished nor sail souls to be condemned. 
They therefore do as they like. Thank you very much. I'll just, before we turn to questions, read out one last thing, which is the, the final verses of Bahadur Shah Zafar uh, before he's put on trial and exiled to Rangoon. The last, because 1858 is not just the end of the company, it's the end of the Mughal dynasty too. And uh, this is a translation of his verses uh, put together by the great Ahmed Ali uh, in Pakistan uh, before his death. When in silks, you came and dazzled me with the beauty of your spring. You brought a flower to bloom, love within my being. You lived with me, breath of my breath, being in my being, nor left my side. But now the wheel of time has turned and you are gone, no joys abide. You pressed your lips upon my lips, your heart upon my beating heart. And I have no wish to fall in love again, for they who sold love's remedy have shut shop, and I seek in vain. My life now gives no ray of light. I bring no solace to heart or eye. Out of dust to dust again, of no use to anyone am I. Delhi was once a paradise where love held sway and reigned, but its charms lie ravished now, and only ruins remain. No tears were shed when shroudless they were laid in common graves. No prayers were read for the noble dead. Unmarked remain their graves. The heart distressed, the wounded flesh. The mind ablaze, the rising sigh. The drop of blood, the broken heart. Tears on the lashes of the eye. But things cannot remain, O Zafar, thus. For who can tell? Through God's great mercy and the prophet, all may yet be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, William. William, before we open it up, just one question, because you talked about the Queen and all of the issues around it. Uh, Mahmoud Mamdani argued in New York at JLF that in his book, The Settler or the Native, that in Nuremberg at the trials when human rights came to the fore and they, they said that the person who committed the crime was held responsible, but not the state. And the allies never looked back at their complicity. In, in, in America, for example, they can kill seven million uh, Native uh, uh, Americans or First Nation Americans. And similarly in India, the big question is, should there be some kind of atonement by the British for all that they did, rather than just say the General Dyer held responsible for the Jallian Bala Bagh. And being British and having just come from there with this great outpouring mm. of grief of a queen who was, in many ways, wasn't quite Queen Victoria, but certainly was complicit for 70 years in all that the British did, even as the empire fell apart. How do you view that in today's context, both for America and here? Well, it's a question which has very much come to, to the fore lately, and, and you've had this very stark difference between the extreme mourning in Britain and the anger coming out of some, particularly the younger generations in India, uh, and equally in Kenya and other places. Um, I think, you know, one can recognize that two different things are true, that there are this very, very dark past, um, which the royal family in the ages of old definitely had some capacity in. The East, it was Queen Elizabeth I that gave the first charter for the East India Company. The uh, royals from that period were also involved in the Royal African Company, which began the slave trade. Uh, and the, not only the, the, the mass transshipment of human slaves from Africa to the Caribbean, but the wiping out of the indigenous Caribs. All these things happened, uh, certainly without a, much criticism from the Crown, and often with, with direct financial investment from the Crown. Therefore, the, lot of, some of the riches which the, the Crown holds today come from this, in addition to which, of course, you have examples of the loot, like the koh i diamond sitting on the Queen Mother's throne, which Camilla presumably will wear for her investiture next year. Um, now, there's a whole list of different possible responses to this. First of all, you can recognize that the Queen personally led an exemplary life, was 
dignified, elegant, restrained, humble, all these things, and yet recognize that all this history is true and it's there. Those, you can hold those two things together. I think um, it's, it's, you need to, in a sense, to understand that this is the death of a 96-year-old woman who, who was you know, a mother and a grandmother, and you can hold that on one side, but also say that the British have got a lot of reckoning with their past to do. The legal situation in, ter in terms of reparations, to give it a straight legal answer, is that the, the, the whole question of loot, reparations, and returning of, of goods collected in war is governed by the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention is signed in, in I think, soon after the First World War, uh, let's say 1920, somewhere thereabouts, and therefore it covers, for example, Jewish art treasures looted in the Second World War by the Nazis, but it doesn't uh, go backwards and cover, say, goods looted by the British from Delhi. So legally, that's where the situation is. You can't legally, at the, as the law currently stands, go to the British government, take out a law case, and say that you've got to give back the koh or Ranjit Singh's throne or anything else that you see in the Victoria and Albert Museum or the British Library. As far as Britain is concerned, people outside Britain, I think, don't understand how little the British actually learn about their empire at school. After the end of the empire in the 19, uh, in the 1947 India and then the whole series of 60 decolonizations in the, in, during the Queen's reign up to the present, um, the British sort of packed away empire like a sort of trunk into the attic and it's not taught in school. Therefore, you have a situation where most British, not only kids but adults, even highly educated ambassadors representing their country across the, the world with a first in history from Oxford can go about their business without, say, knowing as much about the potato famine as the Irish know, knowing about the extinction of the Tab Tasmanian Aborigines in a way that the Australians know, or knowing the details of the Jelly and Wallabad massacre or the 1857 massacres in the way that many Indians will know. And in a sense, before you're going to have a... Uh, given that there's no, there's no legal redress currently, what you need first, before you can have a serious discussion about reparations, I think, is to educate the British, which is, in a sense, what these books, among other things, are trying to do. Not just me, there are many, many others working on this coalface. It's a huge uh, field, because so little, until recently, has been written about this that is open-eyed and, and, and so on. Uh, and this just doesn't cover atrocities in India. There's the whole question of Mau Mau uh, in Kenya, when the mass torture of Kikuyu in the 1950s, even during the Queen's reign, and so on. But the British simply don't know this stuff. And, and so having any sort of, I mean, already attempts to, by, for example, the National Trust, to um, highlight some of these gorgeous houses, which turn out to have been built either with East India Company loot or slave money from the Caribbean, have met massive opposition from people who's, who have been used to hearing that their ancestors were heroes. And so unlike Germany, where because the Germans lost the war, they were able to engage in a massive bout of soul-searching. That never happened in Britain. And the British never had, in a sense, to look into their souls and read the dark stuff of their past and recognize that the people they have on their plinths in Trafalgar Square and in, the, in Pall Mall uh, are, can today, viewed from our sensibilities, be seen as war criminals. Uh, that process is beginning, but there is resistance, particularly in the Tory party, um, interestingly, one of the people that seems to get it is the new king, Charles, the, Charles III, as he now is, made a speech last year in Barbados talking about the unbelievable, the, un, the unique abomination of the slave trade, was the word he used at, at the independence of Barbados. And then um, at Kigali this year, at the Commonwealth Head of Government's meeting, uh, he talked about the need to acknowledge the darkness in our history. Now, that's not language you'll hear from the Tory party, or certainly wouldn't hear from Boris Johnson, who might regard that, in his own words, as woke nonsense, but instead, you'll hear it from, from this guy. So there may be that we're at a turning point, and that we have someone now who is prepared to do this. But, I mean, up to now, you've had these ridiculous situations where the royal family would go to India on a royal tour, would go to Jalia Mullabag, lay a wreath, but not apologize. Uh, which, of course, just made things worse. To go there and not apologize, David Cameron did the same. 
And did you want to just share how over 20 years you researched it and the kind of effort it's taken in the archive and, of course, proof as well? So um, I think in, in scholarly or academic terms, the thing that's most useful of these books is the, uh, the massive use they, they make of previously unused uh, Persian language Mughal sources, um, both in Britain and in India. And the key to that for me was my friend and collaborator, a guy called Bruce Winnell, who, who, who very tragically died soon after the publication of Anarchy of Advanced Galloping Pancreatic Cancer. Um, but for 20 years, we worked together on these manuscripts. And, and the, the Mughals were spectacular historians and autobiographers and memoirs. Um, and some of these things have been translated in the 18th century, but most, nine-tenths of it, remain sitting in dusty archives, often in its small, obscure... Um, in the, for example, one of the most useful libraries we found for the anarchy was somewhere called Tonk in Rajasthan, which has a spectacular library, almost impossible to use, thanks to Mala Singh bullying... Um, what was your chief minister? Um, uh, him, uh, Mala, uh, Vasundra Rajay. Vasundra Rajay. Uh, we managed to get access to these things and got them uh, f photographed, translated, and incorporated into, into the narrative. And, and there are hundreds of, of narratives similar to that for future generations of historians, but no one, virtually no one in India reads Persian anymore. Uh, it's just not a language which, which, which people bother learning that, other than a handful of academics and a handful of universities. Huh? But particularly old Persian. And Bruce had a capacity to read this stuff as if it was the front page of the New York Times. He could just go straight through this with a sort of magical... Uh, and produced beautifully elegant translations. So th this quartet is dedicated very much to him uh, and it's his work. Question. One right there. And again. <laughs> it is the end of the day. Hi, William. Um, you know, as a... As, as a One of our most important sponsors. We have a big round of applause for Miguel. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Organic India. <laughs> you know, as a, as a British citizen myself, who's, who's also um, travelled the world quite a bit and lived outside the UK, such as, uh, as you have for many years now, not, a, not particularly a royalist, to, to say it mildly, um, I'm, I'm interested in the reaction that, because I know you've, you've, you've given speeches like today in, in London, in Cheltenham, other you know, large literature festivals and so forth. What, what kind of reaction have you, have, have you had? And, and what's your own perception on, because it really baffles me that, that no apology is still forthcoming, as little as that might cost you. Know, seem to, sure. To, so what's, what's your own take on that? So literary festival crowds, as, as, the, as people here will attest, uh, tend not to be uh, uh, extreme right-wingers, shall we say. <laughs> uh, you're almost 90% uh, of all festival crowds anywhere in the world will be, will be slightly left-leaning or centrist liberals. Uh, and you're not likely to find card-carrying imperialists, uh, racists, Nazis, or fascists uh, turning up at events like this. Therefore, at, 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 at literary festivals, you know, you're very much already among the converted. But that's not true in places like Twitter, uh, I can assure you. <laughs> and there are regular skirmishes in the, uh, in the trenches of, 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 of the Twitter sphere. Um, no, I think, I think, I mean, things are definitely changing. I mean, half the, the reason for this mixed reaction has been that so many people now have read this stuff, whether it's, the, whatever it was, the six million people that saw Shashi's speech at the Oxford Union or, uh, or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, the cat is out of the bag. People know that these houses are built with slave money. And when you go around one of these gorgeous National Trust houses and, and buy an expensive cream tea with delicious sort of artisan jam on your scone, uh, you know that the, the gorgeous lake in front that looks like, you know, you'd expect Colin Firth to wade through it in his britches was, in fact, built on, on proceeds of transatlantic slave money and, the, you know, the hideous suffering of, of, of generations of, of black Africans transported to cotton fields in the Caribbean uh, or built with the loot of the East India Company in the, in, in the uh, famines of Bengal. So I think it's an irreversible historical process that this knowledge which was not there in the 1950s or 60s and now is. You can't keep knowledge 
in a little sack. Uh, once it's out, it's out. And um, I can understand, in a sense, you know, people that have gone through traditional schooling and have not learned this, assuming that, you know, when they hear that, you know, some hero like Clive, who's been, you know, held up as an exemplary character, turns out to be kind of Lord Voldemort, um, you can understand that there's a certain amount of confusion. Um, and I understand that, and you should understand that. Uh, but, you know, I think through education, through lectures, this is how you, you this is the process by which you turn it around. I've just started a podcast uh, on this with my, the, the, the woman I wrote the Koinor book with, Anita Anand. And it's been a surprise hit. It's been in the, it started off at number one in the British podcast charts ahead of uh, all sorts of, uh, ahead of Megan even, um, with her, <laughs> with her archetypes. Uh, and it's still in the, uh, very much in the top 10. And so there is an appetite to learn this stuff. Um, and I, I don't, you know, there are the whole, particularly a younger generation, very much happy to take this on board in a way that their parents may not be. Uh, but it'll take time and it takes education. And I hope that ultimately it, has, it relies on getting on the curriculum. Because it's a hopeless situation where, you know, the Brits are the only people that don't know what they've done. And I've been present at parties in, in Ireland where you have some idiot say, Oh, but you know the Irish caused the potato famine, or something like that. Or equally, you know, I've had guests in, in India who said, "Oh, the British did wonderful things. What about the railways?" And and you just cringe if you do know the the, the reality. Um, so it's it's you know it's a complicated story. It's not a black and white story. There are many areas of grey, but there's huge bodies of knowledge that need to get out there now, and 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 that's hopefully what these books are doing. <laughs> I just want to say, uh, like some of us here, I was uh, born and brought up in India, and what we were taught in history class and history lessons was a very sort of whitewashed version, and we, we, we never heard about all this. We heard how wonderful Clive was and what great work the East India Company did, but we, we were never taught that, and I, I think many of us of our age who grew up and were educated in India. No, I mean, that's just, why these... Just, just a comment. Most of these, I mean, most of my books now sell in India rather than anywhere else, and, and, and people don't know there. And, and people also have a, have a very... Um, I, I think it, it, history is taught very boringly in India through rote learning and, and dates. And also, I think, you know, it, there's been a tendency that even in, in, at an academic level... Um, Indian history departments have tended to be dominated by Marxists um, who have very sophisticated takes on history in their own way, but the history uh, of Marxism is, is a, a one of economic forces rather than personality-led uh, history. Uh, so uh, it's often very dull to read. Um, and India has had a sort of oddly unpeopled history that's full of economic forces and dynasties, and, but, but very little personality or, or narrative. Uh, and people are hungry for that. There's a whole new generation of, of historians in India, like uh, uh, Manu Pillai or Anirudh Kanesetti, rising up, who are producing these wonderful books that are beginning to um, tell the story uh, more fully and more in a more subtle and nuanced way. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's there's still a long way to go. Right there. Oh yeah. Go ahead. After Anarchy, what's next? What are you working on? I've, uh, these four books have come out, not here because I've got a rather complicated publishing history here, and they're all published by different people, but uh, in India and in Britain, these four books have come out as a box set, and that's now, as far as I'm concerned, that's that 20 years' work done, boxed, and, and off. What I'm doing now is going back to my first interest, which was, was really early history, and, and those of you who went to the Silk Root session this morning uh, will have heard the sort of thing that uh, I'm thinking about at the moment, which is a book about what, what, what I think I'm going to call the Indosphere, which is the whole world of Indian influence that we haven't been taught about either. So the way that uh, an Indian religion, Buddhism, took over China and Japan and Korea. The way that uh, Hinduism went down and the, ending up with the largest Hindu temple in the world, built not in India, but at Angkor Wat. The way that Indian mathematics and numbers traveled first to the Arab world, then to medieval Italy, uh, through the intercession of, of Fibonacci, who was brought up bizarrely in Algeria in a Pisan 
trading uh, center and brought Arabic numbers to Sicily from, from whence they spread throughout Europe to the rest of the world. So the numbers on your phone uh, in front of you now uh, or your computer keyboard uh, are of originally of uh, Ashokan Indian uh, origin. Uh, but we know them in Europe as Arabic numbers because that's where we got them from. Um, and so, the, so it's a story of, of the, the diffusion of, of Indian soft power um, between the second century BC and the 12th century. Up here. Yep. Actually, it's really odd because I grew up in Kanpur, and Kanpur had two sites of the worst atrocities during the mutiny against the British. The Satichara massacre Bank, part uh, uh, and the memorial well. well. So brutalities are on all sides. Correct. And Kanpur was really the epicenter for a lot of bad stuff because the British had a lot of army in Kanpur, which was kind of like the midpoint of India for them to deploy anywhere. But again, you know, it, it, your generation was taught to see these as atrocities. One can equally see them as, as you know, heroic acts of resistance. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Maratha, yeah. Yeah, great. Hi, thanks so much for this talk and for your work. Oh, hi, hello, sorry. Yeah, yeah for sure. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I work on, I'm of Indian descent, but I work on Haiti a lot. And a lot of what you have said today reminds me of discourses in Haiti and about Haitian history that have been silenced. Um, you know, that's kind of a term that this famous anthropologist historian wrote a book called Silencing the Past, which is about the uncovering of the narrative of atrocities in Haiti and also um, the slave revolution, the only successful one in history in 1804, which was basically silenced for a long time. So apropos of that, I have a couple of questions regarding um, awareness in Britain, right? So one question is, um, with the famine in Bengal in 1770, right? Um, was there public awareness in Britain of that? And what was the, re the reaction to it? Um, I know Clive was on trial, is that right? No. Sort of. Okay. So, so 1770 uh, to 1774, there's actually four years of famine in and the final sort of collapse of the company and the reckoning comes 1774. Mm. So in this period, to go to India as a Brit, you have to have an East India Company passport, and they only give it out to their own people. So there's no sort of, you know, um, brave war correspondents parachuting in and speaking from the front lines. And uh, so, But you do get, for the first time, whistleblowers and disgusted East India Company um, employees send off anonymous letters to the Spectator or the Gentleman's Magazine um, and these things are widely copied, and they make themselves, they, these letters make their way eventually to Massachusetts, where they are an important part of patriot uh, literature in the run-up to the revolution. Uh, and and there's, I mean, it, it's interesting because American historians are not concerned with India in general. This has, been, this, has, this has disappeared from the narrative, but it's work that Emma Rothschild has done a lot of work on, and, I, and there's a great PhD in a book to be written soon. I think that there's so much to be done connecting um, uh, the Atlantic in yep. that era uh, with what was happening with the East India Company, and then later the Raj, um, that hasn't been done. And the other thing that I was just gonna ask is um, about digital archives. Um, I know w with regard to Haiti, um, the Digital Library of the Caribbean and other sort of resources that have opened up um, for collaboration among historians and other people who are surfacing these narratives, which as you point out are incredibly difficult and arduous. Um, are, th are there digital resources or is there a kind of digital impetus? So for it's, it's beginning. The, I mean, the India Office Library has 35 miles of East India Company records in the British Museum, which sit in, in catacombs like, uh, what is it, what's the bank in Harry Potter? Gringotts or, <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, and there's, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's an outhouse in, in Manchester. Um, and um, some of those are digitalized. The National Archives in India has begun, uh, has begun digitalizing its archives. 
But a lot of the stuff from, I mean, for many years you had a lot of subaltern historians saying they had to read against the grain because there were no Indian archives. It's total nonsense. It's only because they didn't read Persian. And they never bothered going to Tonk or to Patna and places like this where there are no nice hotels and where you have to sit in the YMCA and work on this stuff. Uh, and it's often, you know, the obstruction at every way from, from librarians and stuff. It's, it, it, I mean, there can be, there are times when you're just knocking your head against a, a wall and, you know, you can't photograph stuff. Can you photocopy it? No, you can't photocopy it. You have to, you know, and to copy some of this stuff out by hand would take 20 years. Um, so, yeah, the, it, but, it, but it's there. And the most dramatic example is when I wrote this book, The Last Mughal. And there are literally, there are um, hundreds of PhDs talking about reading the Imperial Archive against the grain, is the great sort of subaltern uh, phrase, because there's no records. For them. Sitting in Delhi, in the National Archives of India, and I, I was just only discovered this because I was, sometimes it takes, you can imagine, quite a while for these things to appear from the vault, so I would sort of sit browsing the catalogues while waiting for stuff to turn up. But this was when I was writing White Moguls. And I saw this little book called The, the Mutiny Papers. And it's, not a, it's quite a thick volume, of, uh, and it's catalogued very minutely of, of 30,000 papers seized from the rebel camp in 1857, but it's all in, in, in difficult uh, 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 court Urdu in shorthand or, uh, or in Persian. Uh, and it's a major undertaking. To, to get, but anyway, it's, it's, it's now been done. Uh, there are very, very good records in India, many of which survive. I mean, even now, I'm I went uh, recently to the, the main uh, Rajasthan archive in Bikaner, where a lot of the princely records taken from the different princely courts in at Independence in 1947 have all been put. And they, they have this amazing guy who's cleaned the place out and, and preserved it and got anti-termite stuff in. And uh, it's amazing work he's done. And it's, it's an, it, that repository alone is, I mean, it's, it, it's like a sort of tr a train station. Um, it's a vast, with room after room, racks of things right up to the ceiling, high ceiling rooms with hundreds of thousands of documents for every tax register in Rajasthan going back who knows how far. Uh, and then beyond paper to copper plates and stuff. Um, so, I mean, there are so much, there's so many materials just waiting for people to look at. I mean, it's very easy, just in a sense, to do a Said and, you know, and read a couple of nice Victorian travelogues and point out the racism, but it's harder to go to Bikaner learn medieval Mawari and, and, and pour over the stuff. <laughs> I mean, the Baikagas, the Baikagas that were maintained by the Marwaris, who were primarily yeah. bankers, still exist in vast volumes of yeah. rock, the length and breadth, not just in Rajasthan, but in, uh, in, in Calcutta, which is where uh, they, you know, they sat. And, and you, I mean, you do have historians who do do this work. One of our great JLF heroes is Bien Goswami, who's, uh, if you don't know his work, he's, he's uh, Sanjo and I would both uh, certainly put our money on him being the greatest living art historian of India, uh, or painting in India, yeah. And he realized that in a sense that, you know, European art is full of names like Raphael, Leonardo, Rembrandt, you know, the greats of literature, but that India was always known as sort of, you know, it was always Kangra school or Guler school. And he realized, of course, there are individual artists in India too. So in the 1950s, for the first time, he, began, he went doggedly after the man he thought was the greatest Indian artist, which again is a wonderful artist called Nainsuk. And, he, you know, there were very little to go on at first, but then he realized, then he somehow, there's one picture of Nainsuk taking his patron's ashes to Hardwa to immerse in the Ganges in a particular year, let's say 1764. So he went to Hardwa, and at, on the ghats at Hardwa, I don't know whether any of you have ever been there, you have these pandas who have the records of the pilgrims, and if anyone, if anyone today goes back to, uh, to, to take the ashes of an ancestor, uh, of, of a beloved one there, the pandas will reconnect you with your village, your caste, and, and be able to locate the story of your ancestors instantly. So he, realizing this, he went there and he managed to find the pandas that had the particular notebooks of Nainsuk's village. 
uh, in the 1760s and found miraculously an inscription by Nainsuk himself with a picture in the Pandas records. So this, you know, this is the sort of work that can be done if you're really dogged and go after the primary sources with a, uh, w with a real uh, uh, flair and determination. <laughs> I'm happy to take any questions at all afterwards. So. Hi there. Uh, <laughs> as an expert studying uh, English corporate power um, that exacted depredations on uh, societies for imperial benefit, I was just curious if you've seen that pattern repeat in other imperialist powers, European or otherwise, and do you see that pattern, which seems cyclical, being we see the being that we are living through an age of corporate uh, concentration of corporate power and wealth? Is it usually a precipitation of circumstances that breaks sure. that cycle? The answer is yes, and and it's m more so than I realized even when I wrote um, the anarchy. Um, Elizabeth, the Elizabethan court basically leased out imperial enterprises through charters to private individuals. So not only uh, do you have the kind of Muscovy Company, the Levant Company, not only do you have your um, the East India Company, the Levant Company, and the Royal Africa Company, which did the, uh, the slave trade, uh, you also have in this part of the world the uh, Rhode Island Company, the Virginia Company, and still existing, the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, and these were all consortiums of Elizabethan merchants who got together, pooled their resources, raised money, and, and went on uh, little sort of private imperial uh, expeditions, which might, might succeed or fail. Uh, and you said that, you know, corporate goods for imperial ends. Uh, corporate goods for their own ends, in a sense. These, these were, were money-making enterprises by individuals, which, you know, if they failed, they lost their money. If they succeeded, they made a fortune. Uh, and it, I think it's a mistake to see the East India Company in a sense as a, as a, a British state enterprise, certainly before the, the government takes a controlling share in 1774 when it goes bankrupt. Uh, it is very much a, 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 a private enterprise. So what, you know, the, the modern equivalent would be Elon Musk doing his, his moon exhibitions, expeditions. Um, that's, that's the kind of world we're talking about. Entrepreneurs with money spending it uh, on kind of wacky schemes uh, in the far distant parts of the world. Anyway, any further questions, happy to answer at the book signing if, if anyone wants to... Thank you very much, William Dalrymple. Thank you all very much for being here. Remember, we start tomorrow morning with morning music uh, here at uh, the Skyscape. So see you all tomorrow and have a great, great day and great evening. Thank you. And William is happy to sign downstairs. Downstairs?